Hey, because several of you have asked about the um, uh, book I'm writing, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of a review, and I'm going to do it in a what I'm going to call a, a techie fashion. Uh, uh, I've been hooked up here to do it with QuickTime Player, and uh, which is doing something quite miraculous as far as I'm concerned. I, I uh, don't have a title page for you, so you'll have to take my word for it. I'm calling this book The Boston School Aesthetic. I could just as well have called it The... Um, the um, uh, Boston School of Methods. I mean, it's rather in that category. Uh, but I don't sit there with this kind of a book and say, first do this and then do that. It's not that kind of book. I'm showing you concepts related to the uh, painting. But, um, and I'm basically, this whole book is a concept book. You know, we're talking about uh, Boston School impressionism here, you know. And um, so I spend time uh, going through, well, just as an overview, I spend time going through the difference between the two basic kinds of painting as suggested by uh, Gamel. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that's a definitive breakdown, but it's, it really is it's about as big a one as you can make, and that is the difference between, between uh, 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 academic painting and Impressionism. Academic painting being almost entirely the manufacturing of pictures out of your head. Uh, so I, instead of just simply calling it academic, I, I could call it imaginative painting. And, uh, but imaginative painting can actually have like the oyster gathers of Calais that I mentioned to you before, or other Sargent works, the El Jalejo, can have been made out of pieces and bits too. Uh, so it's an imaginative work, done rather in an impressionist with impressionist marks. I'd have to say. So maybe that's not. Maybe the purely maybe the word academic is the best one. We do know that Gamel was trying in his effort, and he expressly set, uh, points out that his efforts have been entirely about getting the ability to make an academic painting to the next generation. Uh, and um, of, of painters, but you know, and I'd have to say that from my point of view, it's um, it's uh, important that we have the whole sort of body of knowledge. It's also interesting to remember uh, this uh, R. M. Stevenson's comment when he was talking about um, uh, what was happening. He's, he wrote a book on Velasquez, and he was talking about what Velasquez was, was, was waking up to, you know. And it was this, uh, and 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 then by the time you were having, you know, the Carlos Duran and all these people around him. Uh, working from the Velasquez model, or more closely with that uh, uh, way of thinking, which is more visual, uh, you have them referring to academic painting as that, or you know, academic, yeah, academic painting is as, as primitive, and uh, and I don't think he does it to be sarcastic. I simply think he's saying it's not as advanced, and it really isn't actually. And so you can take for granted that the reason so many people, and virtually everybody, actually, in Western art switched from this outline making stuff, which is why it wasn't available to Gamel, was it because in the, it, in the um, in accessing nature, you know, in painting from life, it was a far better model, more efficient, more, 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 more potent, you know, you, you would say more, you had the potential to say more uh, than you can do with the, with the other limited model. Uh, also had the advantage of being direct painting and all that sort of stuff. So I set out that whole model and then I simply uh, walk you through the the variations on impressionism from the you know the Velasquez to the to the um, uh, Monet to the Boston School uh, model and then I just simply talk from there on about the uh, what methods means of the Boston School and, uh, and but particularly focusing on the aphorisms and the ways you have to be thinking if you're going to be like them um, this book uh, uh, you know, with maybe a couple other books, and I would suggest again that I, for the, you know, thanks to Jazz, we, I've just run into this one by this guy named Meldrum, Max Meldrum, an Australian, but a book called The Science of Appearances. Uh, you begin to see how, how this, um, you begin to, I'm sorry, you begin to have a kind of a better sense of where these people were coming from. But uh, suffice it to say that I'm talking about a form of painting that is visually based, not, not based on um, drawing outlines of objects, but based on drawing effects and whatever the, constitutes the, 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 the um, uh, impression on your eye, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the search for an aesthetic within that way of working. So, yeah, I, I typically am just getting long-winded when I mean to be a short-winded. So. But what I, what I want to do is differentiate, though. The primary thing is this, this book is to differentiate a way of working from another one, okay? 
So I'm just going to run you through some chapters. I'll show you some pictures. You'll have some idea what I'm trying to do and how nice the book might look. The format is not exactly this one. When I finally uh, finish this, the, uh, the print is going to be of a different size uh, than I have here, but it's going to be somewhat the same layout. Um, at the beginning of each chapter, I have these quotes. Um, I'm showing um, in, in this one here the realism in, in um, versus, I'm sorry, uh, realism the realism that is impressionism. I'm sorry, I skipped a chapter. Let me go up one. I got to go back one. I got my, I got ahead of myself. This is a slideshow, ultimately, the way I'm doing this. So um, here we go. Um, so this, this first portion is called Two Aims of Representational Painting. And if I, and if I walk you through this, um, you can see that I'm here showing uh, Michelangelo and uh, Leighton Davi, these grand, grand sort of masters of that way of working. And to the right there, you can see the uh, Vermeer. And as I said, these layouts won't be this way, but you can see the Vermeer and the Chardin. And then you can see uh, that I get involved with Velasquez and then begin to introduce some of the Boston School. Uh, so that gets you started. I, this one gets you through some of that early history. Uh, by the way, my writing is, is in... Uh, flux here too, so don't take too much of this if you see, can see it on the screen um, to be lasting. So then there's this thing called the realism that is Impressionism, where I talk about what, um, uh, you know, what some people think is realism, and that's literally the noodling up of everything and what others say realism is, and that is the, that it's the presentation of the entire envelope of nature before you. Um, and there's so, there's so many ways to think about that, but so I just, as I, I've already referred to that a little bit in the chapter, so, so there are the pictures associated with that, and this is the breakdown between Velasquez and his early Velasquez and later. Then I talk about the, some of the Dutch, and uh, there's Holbein, and then I get you into this early history of the, uh, of the other Dutch that begin to wake up this, this way of working. I should probably even bring in Manet, because it's now you're talking about uh, Tonalist is a funny word, but people are working from 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 with masses of paint uh, over outline, you know, as opposed to outline. So um, then I give you, uh, oops, I just went past it. I give you um, Monet Impressionism, and I managed. Did I manage to screw that up? Yeah, I did. But there's a chapter on Monet's Impressionism, um, and uh, it's very clear cut. You'll understand it just immediately. I, as I said, I just wrote this stuff off the cuff. Um, you'll find a very good book by Rewald on his work, um, giving the background. But then I show you all these guys that worked with, with uh, um, uh, Monet. Uh, as he said, he wasn't a he wasn't a teacher. He allowed people to work with him, and he, you know, he, I get. The, I think you know, have to say he was consulting. Uh, with the information he had, with the knowledge that he had, uh, with an, in an effort to uh, to bring people um, uh, into alongside him, you know, to give him what he had, to give them what he had. So then we get to Boston School Impressionism, discuss that, and um, in a large way. And uh, there are the pictures, <laughs> and. And then we get to the method. The method is the school. Now, the method is the school is like the key chapter in this book. Uh, more than once, people coming out of the Lack studio, uh, and Richard Lack himself uses he doesn't he does not actually, um, uh, but others around Lack refer to the Boston School and suggest that what they're doing is Boston School painting. And um, at the, I know that studying with Lack, you didn't do. Uh, what the, the Boston School guys did in this book is here trying to make very clear why that's true and how that's true. But uh, Gamble's point is the method is the school and the way of working, literally how you put down paint, why you do this and not that, what your starts look like, all those things. Lack talks about, about uh, doing a grisaille to do an impressionist painting. I mean, that is not Boston School, not even a little. You don't do preliminary studies on a board and then trace it on. And it's not the same thing. Now, you might get similar results, uh, if you have a good eye, and it won't be exactly similar. In fact, there'll be significant things that will be very different. Um, and uh, in the case of uh, you know Richard Locke, he made an attempt to actually specifically be different. You know, he started bringing style in, 
And that's not something anybody in the Boston School would ever do. But anyway, so that's the, the chapter's methods and, um, and um, you know, the way of laying on paint, the way, the way they, you know, do such an exotic amount of good work in the start, why it's all there, the color, the, the, the design, the significant drawing and all that sort of stuff. All that stuff is there in the lay-in. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that is going to be uh, separated out. And then I talk about some of the, the mentalities associated with it. Uh, and uh, so this chapter um, is called Holistic Rendering by Effects. Now that's the discussion from Benson, and you, if you can look up his daughter's writing. But what we discovered on our own, I mean, yeah, you probably, I'd read everything. And I, although I have to say, this thing came very late to us, that set of quotes from, uh, um, at least to me, uh, from Benson's daughter. And, um, and uh, yeah, but it summarized exactly the way I was approaching painting after a certain point. And I've showed you that little cast drawing, and it'll be in the book uh, that I did trying to sort out best practices uh, based on the visual. And, uh, and we wind up in very much the same place. But the holistic rendering by effects, holistic means seeing the thing as a whole and, and, and playing with effects and their relationships to each other with the attempt to get the canvas all into that visual the harmony as a visual entity as you see it in front of you. So the next chapter is, um, is the um, chromatic chiaroscuro as a method. And so that's the world of lost and found, which if you get what we're doing, you will know that you have to apply that. You can't do what I'm talking about without understanding the idea of the lost and the grand unities and the players. I would call them players, but another word might be readers or significant effects. And uh, so chromatic chiaroscuro, well, actually that was a word used by, by um, uh, Hale, who wrote the book on Vermeer. That's Philip Hale, who was one of the Boston School teachers. And, um, and Hale uh, uh, specifies um, that, um, I mean, identifies that as the method or the thinking of, of, uh, of uh, Vermeer. And um, so what is that, right? So it's very much, again, we're talking lost and found, this chromatic chiaroscuro, that's the clear and the obscure. And uh, when you get to the Boston School, that one of the things they pay enormous attention to is the color of shadows. And uh, that's something even even um, wasn't even all that strong with um, with uh, uh, Vermeer. So all right, and that and uh, and by the way, at the beginning of each of these chapters, I use an enormous number of quotes from people, uh, all kinds of different individuals, some associated, some in opposition. Um, and then there's this discussion of coming out of the fog. So you're seeing that image there by by Benson, and uh, so. This again is; these are all interrelated, <laughs> but the idea of what you paint first, second, and third comes first in this chapter. Why this? Why that? Why you know, etc. And uh, so, what does that mean coming out of a fog? I get right into it, and I show their starts, uh, among other things, that that show you how that actually works, and 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 you'll find the logic of it right there. Um, so, plenty of those little guys. So then the next one is the edges, the question of edges. And the Boston School um, uh, start, the whole idea of bringing all the horses at once, which is a different chapter, but the idea of bringing all the horses at once means including all the elements, all the visual elements of a painting. And uh, as Monet found out much late in his career and with regret, uh, that, that edge, the shape with a silhouette, the silhouetting edge, is a more significant function than he realized. And he wished he had done more work with it, is I believe exactly what he said. Um, um, so the question of edges, Gamal, at one point I was talking to him, I've mentioned this before to all of you. When I was asking about edges in a particular picture I was working on, he said, well, you can, you can fix those up at the end. And of course, he's talking to me about something that you can, can do. But when I asked him about who was the best guy at doing that, he brought me, he took me to Vermeer uh, I'm sorry, to Chardin. He said, over at the museum, there's a Chardin, and you should look at it. And I went uh, eagerly to look at it, and I saw that there was not a single edge in there that looked like it had been patched on at the end. It looked like it, that was part of the package, part of the, part of the elements of the scene, right? So, which gets us to uh, presumably the next chapter, which is um, the visual order. Now, each one of these things is absolutely related to the other one. I mean, when I talk about coming out of the fog, I'm talking about the visual order. 
But there is an order visual. In fact, there's order generally in painting, right? But if you're a, an impressionist, if you're an eyeball, uh, it's all visual. We're talking about the visual relationships. And so there's more, some areas, as I've said, a greater chroma. There's the red, yellow, and blue order, so to speak. The size of masses this and the distribution of those masses. There's, excuse me, there's an order everywhere. So, uh, so how does that influence painting? So what do we mean by it? And, 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 um, and, uh, and then um, how does it affect the process for a Boston School type painter? You know, I, I should say this when I say Boston School type painter. I am a painter who works like the guys in the Boston School, having found it. On the other hand, I had all the words, as it were, from Gamel. And uh, I wasn't trying when I was with him to do anything except an imaginative painting. But as I was leaving him and I was looking for best practices, um, I, I, I found myself more and more responding to the quotes. And Gamble didn't have any great quotes from draw a brilliant outline kind of great quotes, you know, the academic approach. Gamble's firsthand knowledge, is, his, his ears were full of Boston School conversation. So that's what I had to fall back on. I had a lot of other reading to fall back on, but so many of the quotes, I'm talking about Bonat's rule, make it as like as you can the first time and then make it more like. That's an academic talking, and yet it applies so brilliantly to the Boston School way of working, as the, and which is why they bring it to us. But uh, So the visual order, yeah. And then uh, we'll get to the uh, all the horses uh, all over the place at once. Um, in the start, for example, that's the conversation, and I've mentioned it before, so that comes up. Uh, and again, with illustrations, so. And then we have the uh, seeing the whole and the question of breadth. And breadth is the opposite of like littleness, detail, smallness, counting a lot of little things. Breadth is that greater thing that's happening. And the Boston School guys, well, Ang talks the same way. He says, why do, you, why do you make that out of three little things when you could make it out of one big one? As a kind of a, you know, it's the, it, it's the great forms. It's the head being an egg. Uh, and the dominance of those great forms in the great scheme of things, well before that littleness of, of factual, uh, you know, data comes, 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 comes crowding out everything else. Until you learn to see it that way, until you learn to see paintings without looking so hard, without zooming in on them. I did have a student once who uh, said that she couldn't um, paint like me because she her eyes were too good. And I don't dispute the people with really good vision, 2020 type vision, all their whole, through their whole lives where they never had to struggle. Everything they do is gotten by zooming in. Uh, won't have as easy a time as a guy who's just a little nearsighted, who's had to spend his life uh, seeing this to this and that to that, and 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 a lot, and in learning to enjoy the great masses. But you know, you have a huge advantage in one sense, though, as a, as a far-sighted person, and that is you can do both. So I mean, or as a, uh, a person with just plain good vision. So I think I've spent a very long time on this. I do want to do a tiny bit more. Uh, I'll finish the, I'll give you the rest of the chapters and I'll leave this, but um, so uh, next is the uh, uh, actual versus the apparent. This is a huge thing. Gamble was constantly on us to make sure we were painting the visual, not the actual. And uh, it, nothing about painting. So many people actually do believe something else. I'm talking about illustrators and people like that. And I say, that doesn't mean they're going to not draw shapes accurately, but, but we're not trying to draw people and things. We're trying to draw relationships of color, relationships of value, form, chroma, uh, and so on. And um, if we're trying to draw those relationships, that is not the same world. But Gamel, when he said it, he, he was trying to get us to stop looking at things and trying to think if we just, if we just said banana often enough or thought about bananas, we would draw that shape better, you know, of the banana. And so... Uh, that's the, really the key to that discussion there. Um, so the actual versus the apparent is, um, uh, and this page is somehow got messed up. I don't know how that happened, <laughs> the, but there it is again. I was trying to prepare this for you all for today uh, with the way it presents, but that page won't present that way. Um, all right, so, and then what do we have? All right. Um, now, relational truth. Uh, so I, I quoted Tolstoy in the past here, but the idea that everything we do is relational. The truth is this to this and that to that is what's true. Uh, on a painting, you can't say that on this note, I've hit this note. Nine times out of ten, you haven't hit the note in nature. And, uh, but, you can, you, but you can absolutely uh, attune the relationships of things to each other until the truth of that 
set, set of relationships is astonishing. And, uh, and and one of the more wonderful things about painting is that the more you pursue that, the more you're going to find its beauty. You're compelled to get into the beauty, you know, what it's doing, uh, which is why it's so interesting when, when Stevenson says that they painted the truth and, until, the, until the poetry showed up, uh, referring to the Impressionist mind. All right, and I think that's close to the end. Um, here we have the um, absoluteness of relatives, uh, of, rel of relatives, yeah, the absoluteness of relativity. Uh, same basic discussion. I'm not going to tell you all these chapters are going to stay the same, but they may. Now, one of the bigger ones, one of the more important ones to me, is the phonics or the visual response, the phonetic response. So I've talked about that more recently online, so I don't have to spend a lot of time with it, but you understand that we're talking about sound and the fact that the letter A says ah or ah or something like that. And you can sound out words, you know, like about would become ah, buh, you know, and you sound your way through the word. Uh, rather reflexively, in other words, as soon as you see a letter, you sound the letter. Well, what we do in painting, if you're in the phonetic sense, is as soon as you see a color, you look at two other colors. You just, you start relating it immediately. That's a phonetic response. It's a color to color response. You know, if you're talking about how big is this or what angle does it have, you look at others of, the, of its kind. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's, I'm calling that a, you know, it's, an, it's a visual response though. You're not looking at a thing and saying uh, the leg and thinking in your head, you're actually responding visually. That's a very poor interpretation of what I just did. But it's of what I, I know what the book says, but uh, it gets you the idea uh, adequately. So um, with, um, I think that fundamentally covers it. Um, I do have a chapter on the finish and the nature of finish in this kind of work. And somebody had asked me, and I'm going to do a conversation about that, uh, or I will have just done one, I think, on that. Uh, I, I mean to cover it. And this <laughs> this one here question came later, so I'm doing it today. But but the um, the 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 um, question of finish, the question of detail comes up. And how much detail do we bring in? Well, when you're working the way we work, you work until the music so you've brought the music and you stop. That's When the music is there, you may stop. <laughs> but if you're a realist, of course, that's the music is, you know, who can do the most details on the, you know, the, how many angels on the head of a pin or something or other. Uh, so, and I say that not a, a, but I'm talking about a kind of a fool the eye kind of guy who's trying to show you every tiny little thing and has microscopic eyeballs, you know. Uh, this is not that kind of a game. This is a different one. And Degas talks about that explicitly. Uh, and I refer to that, his conversation. Uh, so that's basically the book. Uh, its purpose is to differentiate this form of realism from, uh, uh, from, from uh, outline-based, imaginative storytelling, you know, illustration-type realism, and, uh, and from, um, yeah, I don't know what to call it, left-to-right realism, you know, just the idea of drawing outlines and filling them up and noodling from left-to-right. Degas referred at one point, as I said, to... Um, to uh, what drawing is. He said it's what happens between the contours uh, of objects, basically, right? Uh, I don't kind of, I kind of agree with him. It's what happens between the contours, but not necessarily of objects, <laughs> but the contours of value units. So, and that's a discussion I should have in here too, the question of value units as opposed to object units. But uh, that all comes up, all those things come up. And so it's underlying, uh, what the whole point of the book is I give you the underlying thinking. I'm trying to get the mind of the Boston School. Um, and I call it the aesthetic, but it could, I could have called it the method, or I could call it the mind, uh, but um, uh, it's a bit of a sort of a, you know, combination that just hopes to get an idea across to you of what this is. And uh, I think it'll be successful. Tons of pictures, I think we'll have 150, 200 pictures, so. And uh, lots of uh, stuff from the Boston School that you may never have seen before as well as other things from history. So uh, with that said, I better stop. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's been a very long-winded one. I hope you didn't just get sick and tired of it. Uh, thank you for asking. All right, see you next time. Oh, do share, comment, um, uh, like, all those things. Yeah, much appreciated, very much appreciated. All right.